All right, our next speaker, again, we're going to continue along the lines of, lines of effort and uh, a kind of a peek into the tent, what the Defense Health Agency is going to do uh, with uh, uh, our ability to, to, again, achieve joint first solutions where it makes sense. And so, uh, in fact, uh, probably the bedrock of the joint first solutions where it makes sense is going to be in the R&D community. So with that, uh, Admiral Dahl, uh, you've got the stage, our inaugural director, RDA, DHA. General Welcome Rob. aboard again. General Rob. Again. again. Hua. Hua. Arr. Air power. Air power. Eureka. <laughs> uh, good afternoon again, General Rob and members of the research community. Thank you for taking the marathon ride through Thursday and being here to listen to what I have to present to you. My privilege as the Director of the Research, Development, and Acquisition Directorate is to talk with you today about what it is, our relevance, and invite your collaboration. And this is also a recruiting effort. The, yeah, always, That's always. Right. It's a recruiting effort. But first, the disclaimer, which I think you've seen before, so I'm not going to reiterate it. I can only promise you I won't send you a postcard from Tahiti for the royalties that I received today. <coughs> also, you've probably heard this from the standpoint of our overall overarching vision that we put first those who serve the defense of our country, and specifically, what does research do about that, the so what? In terms of funding, I just want to make sure you're familiar with some acronyms. DHP, which I'll probably mention 10 or 12 times, Defense Health Program, and the funding it provides, which is in the area of about 1.3 billion, and that's without congressional special interests. If you add that in, you're over 2.2 or so billion dollars. But right now, the faucet is very tight. CR has, as usual, imposed a restriction on the availability of those funds. So to the credit of those who manage research, they have cleverly been able to carry over funding to sustain important projects, and we will await further events in those housed just down the street. There is service and agency-wide funding available. It doesn't compare in volume to DHP, but certainly there's pockets of excellent quality research going on. And in the interest of time today, I can't get real specific, but suffice it to say that each service has specific areas which serve their equities to advance in a particular medical field what their line is telling them we need, what their requirements are. In terms of the RDA, we too have a vision and it's fairly straightforward. We want to be the global leader for discovery. We want to be the leader that looks at both knowledge and material products in order to continually enhance what is to be force health readiness, resilience, and rehabilitation. And there are three other R's. We want to be revolutionary. We want to be responsive. And we must be relevant, particularly to the operational needs of our community. And our mission is to make those breakthroughs. And we don't do this alone. If anything comes through to you, it is a team effort, whether across the services or across nations, as Admiral Walker recently discussed. But we translate those discoveries into products. And we do so in somewhat a unique way. Unlike a carrier, unlike an aircraft, we have that other three-letter organization that we are beholden to called the FDA. <laughs> and that in itself is a unique criteria, or you might say uh, operational variable in our relationships, we which we must always inform the line community about, because that three-letter organization is usually not visible to them in their particular acquisition processes. You'll see below, very appropriately illustrated, right pat, where, of course, the 7-11th, General Jex is in the audience. And then you have the Inouye building, named after Henry Inouye, who was a great proponent of research 
It houses both an Army and a Navy command. And then you have over on your right the uh, Army Medical Research and Materiel Command. Tri-service joint. So what do we look like? Well, we're pretty lean, we're pretty aggressive, and from the standpoint of how we get the work done that I'll, that I'll discuss with you, let me start at the top. The colors are important. My position as director is a nominative position, and so the expectation is either an Air Force or an Army or in some other flavor will follow me in this process of oversight of this organization. I have an advisory committee known as the PAC, the Program Integration <laughs> Advisory Committee, which looks at how we prioritize what are our projects, our programs. And I'll talk about the JPCs, the Joint Program Committee, shortly. And then I work with, I have the privilege of working with a deputy director and an administrative staff, as well as the four divisions. From the right, the Veterans Affairs, overseen by Dr. Kelly Bricks, who is with the VA. The VA, for example, has a very robust psych health uh, program. And so it wouldn't be for us to reinvent that, but merely to benefit from an interaction with that. You also may know that there is an ongoing discussion about making the convertibility of data in the military record transparently available or seamlessly available to the VA. Now, that hasn't happened yet, but that represents a huge mother load of data, which eventually can be exploited for the very good of our beneficiaries, all six million of them. Second is the advanced development. This is overseen by uh, Captain Sean Biggerstaff, Navy. And Sean oversees what would be the 6-4 through 6-7 money. I heard there was earlier a discussion on how to get from 6-3 to 6-4. This is a question that Sean has to deal with from the standpoint of what are the criteria that allow a project that is positioned at, hey, we've done our animal studies, you know, all the, all the bench top studies are done, ready for a phase, three tri uh, phase one trial. How are we going to get there? Next is clinical infrastructure. This is overseen by Colonel Matt Hepburn who is Army, and Matt oversees questions like, well, we've got all these MTFs, and they've got all this great work going on individually, but what are we doing together? Can we have a multi-site uh, study going on? It's very difficult now. I'm sure some of you have had experiences with IRBs, or CRADAs, or other important instruments of making processes work appropriately, but somewhat individual to services, let alone to the very MTFs where these, where these processes reside. And it's our effort at RDA to look at a standardization of the process. We're not there to control it, but we are there to ensure that as you look across the fence, if you're in Navy and you're looking at Air Force or you're looking at, at Army, that the process looks the same. How many species do you think the Veterinary Corps oversees, the Army Veterinary Corps, with one policy? Over 15. We have three policies, and how many species do we oversee? That's right, one. So it begs the question of, can we get there? And I think we can. And then, as equally important, is science and technology, which Colonel St uh, Linda Steele Goodwin U.S. Air Force oversees. This is the, the high-risk area, the 6-1 through 6-3 funding that is instrumental in getting off the ground either that knowledge product or that material product and coordinating with the various labs. It may not be apparent to you, but DOD, and particularly medical research, assumes a lot of risk, and we're expected to do so in part because industry is not so much interested in assuming the risk, but they are interested in when we bring it to a 6-3 level, that we have strategically positioned them to take it on through the 6-4, the phase trials, and so on, if it's a material product, so that they have some confidence in this will be profitable for them, 
I mean, when you think about it, some of the unique needs of the military are hard to convince an industry to go for because we need six of them or we need 25 of them. Uh, robotics is one example of that. And so where you can align industry as early as possible with what's going on in the basic research, this is something Linda works with, as well as just the overall product portfolio, which I'll go into in just a moment. The lines of effort you've heard about, I'm not going to bear a lot on them except to say, if we're not relevant to this, we're not relevant to health affairs, which sets the policy. We are an execution arm of the DHA. But with the policy, or I should say, the policy aligned with this, we can execute comfortably within it. And I'll just mention a few things. Eliminating unnecessarily, unnecessary duplication of effort. Right now, I can't tell you what DARPA's portfolio is. And likewise, they can't tell me what Army's research portfolio is. And NIH, while they are much further ahead in being transparent, we realize the need to collaborate across the services to avoid unnecessary redundancy. Sometimes replication is important, but for the sake of a transparent awareness, we don't have that yet. And continually improving our medical capabilities to provide contemporary health care. There are practices out in the civilian community, for example, some orthopedic procedures, which are not necessarily incorporated into the practice within the military treatment facilities. It's not to say it's wrong, but it is to say, how do you make that transfer of that into the environment of the military treatment facility so that one can do so with confidence that this is a valuable procedure, that not just valuable, but credible, that it has evidence-based research behind it. Ensure a ready medical force. Well, certainly when it comes to conflict, many in here have served overseas and know how important that is, but it's not just a matter of it being for conflict, it's the balance between that, natural crises, or an infectious disease. So that the point being that there's a way in which the configuration of what we are asked to do can be adaptable to the particular threat we're confronted with. And research has a role in all of those areas. Develop and support strategic partnerships. Uh, you may have heard the Millennium Cohort Study, 75-year-long study. At least it's supposed to be. We'll see how long the funding lasts. <laughs> Over 200,000 people enrolled in this, and most recently, a family component integrated into this survey approach to assessing warfighter transition, family status, and so on. A number of questions. Well, the UK is doing something not on that scale, and that's not to say that's important in terms of scale, but in terms of content, they are also doing something like that. So there's a crosstalk between those, and there's numerous other examples. As far as the TRICARE benefit program, this plays into the earlier mention I made of some practices that are not necessarily done in the MTFs, or if you go out service to get treatment, it's not going to be uh, covered. And yet it's considered within the standard of care by the community within which you live. Well, that begs the question, how do we validate that? And research has a role in looking at that as a clinical evaluation. And then in terms of developing core resources for global health engagement, well, aside from my lack of a T there, the, uh, the intent is to say when you have an Ebola crisis, while on the one hand there's all sorts of interest and earnest effort, we cannot lose sight of its role or its importance in a context of projects. There are more people dying of AIDS per day than there are the total deaths for Ebola. It's not to say either is less or more important, but the point is that if we can take vaccine research for a different virus and piggyback it to that for Ebola, what a wonderful transition that is for the research we've already had ongoing. Our areas of focus with that line of effort composition that I just mentioned as, as context include the centers of excellence, asking questions about what is a center of excellence, what should be the administrative support to those centers of excellence, where do they, what's their role in clinical research, 
clinical investigation programs. And I've mentioned some of the challenges, IRBs and CRADAs. Advanced development. Some of you have heard the expression, valley of death. And that is something gets as far as animal research, looks good, but doesn't make it across into phase trials. And that is a difficult uh, situation, particularly if you haven't aligned yourself with an industry that's going to say, we'll take it and run with this. So we need to make that better. Regulatory programs, again, tech transfer, intellectual property, the CRADAs, there should be an easy way standardized across the services. There should be further emphasis on patent development. There are, the, one of the thrills of this job is to work with some very clever and intelligent people who, through years of dedication, come up with these vaccines, et cetera, and basically give it to the world. And that's fine, but a return on that can be very beneficial to both the individual as an example to push others to the same heights when it involves some sort of royalty or something you might say as a pat on the back for the work they did, or even to the DOD in general. Executive agencies, there's about 14, 14 of these under consideration for what are their roles post-war. You know now with our diminished uh, conflict, it begs the question, what goes forward, what shouldn't? And also with what Admiral Walker said, what do we partner with as a matter of retaining certain skills and anticipating what the future needs will be? You may have heard of directed energy. Well, what is the risk to the operator? And what is the damage to the target? Because we may be the target, obviously, as well as the operator. And then finally, as far as the fund execution, this is a significant change from a year past, but the RDA is the execution agent for RDT &E, DHP RDT and &E funds, all 1.2 uh, billion. In order to do that execution, we have one of the joint program committees, and I won't go into them more than to say their names are suggestive of the topical areas that are in their portfolio of projects. So simulation, very relevant, uh, both from the standpoint of expense, uh, from uniformity of experience, uh, the politically sensitive issues that go with animals still being used in certain models. Infectious disease, I don't need to mention Ebola, but the point is that that has been the benefit, that has benefited that area from the earlier research on other viruses that is an ongoing issue as it relates to, we're going to the Pacific in bigger numbers than we had in the past. And that's just a soup of infectious diseases. So the skills that we've already developed, whether it's in Peru, in the jungles, in the Amazon, in Egypt, in Thailand, et cetera, this will be brought to bear again in this strategic rebalance to the Pacific. Combat casualty care, you may have heard from uh, Colonel Rasmussen earlier. It's a privilege to work with him. He oversees that particular JPC, and as a result, he has very few hairs left on his head. But the point is that he is an Air Force, he is the lead Air Force example. Now, the reason is because his hair is on fire because he's moving so fast. <laughs> yeah, <with us>. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I bring up uh, uh, Colonel Rasmussen because he is an Air Force, the Air Force chair of that particular JPC, which has over $200 million of projects that it oversees. There are all services represented as chairs within these, uh, these uh, six JPCs. RAD Health, mainly an emphasis on acute radiation sickness. And then clinical and rehabilitative medicine, I'll touch on that a little later, that's regenerative medicine. So what is our scope? Well, very briefly, infectious diseases. I'll mention a different one, enterotoxigenic uh, bacteria, diarrhea, Montezuma's revenge. Between 2004 and 2007, 4 million deployments, 1 million man hours lost to diarrhea, over $2 billion in lost effort, very significant as a mission degrader. And there are talented scientists over at uh, the Inouye building 
who are working on this to develop vaccines to those particular bacteria associated with the problem and made some significant breakthroughs. Traumatic brain injury, that particular emphasis is actually distributed through both combat casualty care as well as through military, uh, military operational medicine and in regenerative medicine. So it's a, it's a shared emphasis among those three JPCs. Burn treatment as well, something that's really been uh, uh, pushed ahead down in uh, San Antonio, uh, but also in alliance with a number of academic institutions to develop novel ways to non-immunogenically immunogenically put skin back on these uh, horribly injured uh, uh, soldiers and, and Marines, sailors, and airmen. Next slide. Talk to myself again. Spectrum of DOD medical, if you think of it in different <laughs> ways, here you have treatment, rehabilitation, recovery. The one not on there is optimization. So we're not only in a position where we have taken what are these very challenging clinical situations starting in the OR and looking at, well, what are the biomarkers that will assist a provider in assessing when to close a wound? Eric Elster at the Uniformed Services University is looking at that question. Over in the middle, you have 3D printing now customizing those prostheses that these individuals, that these, uh, those uh, individuals with amputations wear. So again, working at a personalized sort of service to support uh, and restore their quality of life. And then in terms of recovery, looking at the questions of resilience. Again, I mentioned the Millennium Cohort Study, which is assessing that sort of, what do you do when you've had multiple deployments? and you, you're coming back to your family, then you're deploying again, and so on. And then optimization. I'll tell you what, if any of you know aviators, you're going for a six-hour mission, and then while you're up there, you get another six hours in the seat. How do you keep them alert? How do you keep them from falling into a, a series of what could be deadly decisions? Uh, as a result of disorientation? Do they recognize hypoxia? Or if you're in a submarine, what is the appropriate watch schedule? What ways that you can look at hormonal uh, indicators of what the performance of individuals are during a cycle of six months under sea with no sense of night or day? These sorts of things are also focus, uh, uh, foci for research to say we can utilize our manpower better. Very quickly, the monopoly of how you get your money. If you start on the start, and then you move over to, we have to generate guidance from the standpoint of what does the line need. That means we are able to realize what the gaps are. One big gap. People bleed out in theater. So what's a way to address that? What sort of plasma products could be available to the corpsman? Once you've, uh, once you've realized the gaps, there's a program announcement published, which is, I think many scientists know about where to find these. The point is a pre-proposal, which is really nice. It's like a two or three pager. It's very brief, but it's supposed to capture the essence of the project that you want to you propose, is reviewed by a joint program committee to look at, you know, are the main basics there for what is a promising project that fits into the portfolio that answers the requirement established by the, by the warfighter. If it is, you continue on into the full proposal, which is more akin to what some of you may have seen at NIH and other uh, granting agencies. If not, do not pass go. But once you are into the full proposal, there's both a scientific and programmatic review these are phased reviews, and following good scores on those, you're ending in what it would be a recommendation for funding and then into the contracting experience, which is something we feel needs significant improvement, not because the people aren't there with the good skills, but the whole, the whole greasing of the process has to be improved. And then eventually an intramural or extramural funding. As far as our, our, our clock of participating agencies, Congress, DOD researchers, our federal partners, all of these play into a process that is intended to enhance force readiness. 
operationally relevant. It's not to say that the beneficiary option or, or population is not a target for us for improving, but operationally relevant is a key driver for the research and the way we look at our portfolios. There are a number of available guides out. The President's uh, National Research Action Plan focuses mainly on the uh, mental health of our veterans. VA DOD collaboration, this is a model for what we're trying to develop, which Kelly Bricks works with. And then the uh, best practices, again, a guidance which is published regularly uh, for the purposes of our internal look at what we do in our laboratories. And those laboratories are in a number of areas worldwide, but they're also in collaboration with regenerative efforts through what's known as the Armed Forces Institute of Regenerative Medicine. These are just examples of a few. Uh, they involve uh, the use of stem cells. They involve uh, various resorbable materials. Uh, multiple universities. Some of the challenges, though, go with what looks like a, a heart valve. When you put it in the animal model, there's, a, there's difficulty with getting the cells to regenerate. It isn't to say that it won't happen, but these are ongoing challenges with where some of these, these products are. The DECA arm, if you haven't seen that, uh, Jeff Ling was very closely associated with that. Uh, really remarkable. And from the standpoint of simulation, wound healing, uh, PTSD, there are over 500 projects on TBI PTSD. We think that needs to get a close look to look at is there redundancy, is there a means by which you can determine what complements each other, and where you get more robust power from combining studies. Worldwide, this is an access which our scientists have to a degree that no one else in the world, academics, industry, or other militaries have. And they have to the degree that they set the standard made good on both a benefit to the host nation as well as to the military. So you're talking Thailand, Georgia, Singapore, Cambodia, Vietnam, um, Peru. Uh, some of these have been six, six decades in place to the point where there's generations that have passed through those doors to either participate in supporting the science or uh, merely to be, if you will, supportive administratively. But they're familiar with it. The population buys into it. <coughs> so as I conclude, the intent here is to continue to emphasize joint first. You can go fast if you want to go alone. But together, you will go much, much further. So you can find me on the web. You can find me up at Fort Detrick. Or you can find me at DHA. Or probably, most probably, you can find me on Route 270. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you. Any questions? All right. We get time for a couple questions. There you go. Back row. Oh. Yes, ma'am. You talked about that procurement life cycle and wanting to improve it. So what is the timeline? What is the timeline for improving the procurement, which gets into advanced development and a strategy that allows us to take all the six, well, really six, three projects and put in place criteria that say you can pass go and go on to 6-4 funding and on to the phase trials, or you can't. That should be within a year. We're so right this, now are negotiating. You, are, are you talking this cycle or, or the other one? Uh, this would be just AD CONOPS. This cycle actually. That's it, not a year. That's, that's in place. I mean, that's the congressionally oh, directed. So do you have that cycle up here, or are you were just no, talking theoretical? No. Like I, you do in my office all the time. <laughs> I can't get a word in, usually. <laughs> <laughs> no, the advanced development capability for DHP is new. It has not existed. And we are using a model that the Army has developed as a means to look at what are best practices and integrate those and then build on that. But that, that should be within the year. So if I have the opportunity to talk with you next year, I should be able to say this is exactly how it's happening. 
Got any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, can you explain to us what the timeline is for making the true discovery going through all this trial? To actually make it to the bad side where it's helping the soldiers care and everything? So, what's the timeline for an idea to actually benefiting a patient. I'll give you one story. Imagine yourself on a train in Egypt, chickens and people running down the aisle of that car, and there are two officers on board, and they're traveling between site visits, because a lot of these research projects are done in villages, et cetera. And they start an idea on malaria which is a huge challenge, not only for the world, 600,000 people die of malaria every year, but it remains a threat. It's actually killed service members even within the last five years. So they start thinking, you know, why don't we do a whole protein, kind of like what um, the polio vaccine started as. But you know, this is, a, this is a, a controversial idea because we've moved on to just parsing out a single protein and making antibodies to it, or looking at a DNA sequence and making antibodies to that. The intent being it's specific, and you're going to minimize cross-reactivity. And there they are saying, 10 years ago, we should look at a whole protein, literally injecting the whole sporozoite dead, radioinactivated, but see what happens. So you go through a 10-year process. And last year, again, as a team effort, this is not just Army or Navy or Air Force or NIH alone. Anthony Fauci was part of this project. That they did just that. They put the sporozoite into volunteers who were then subjected to malaria. Small group, six people, not statistically robust, but nobody got malaria. And as a percentage, that's five, well, four times better than any other particular vaccine that's been tried. So 10 years is pretty good. Sometimes it can take a little longer, but that's a, that's a decent range, 10, 12 years, when you think about it. And that's our problem, because we need to be aligned with, in, with academics and industry to the extent that they, they sort of have a, a, a longevity that in three years, most of the faces here will be in different jobs. And they take that expertise with them. So it, it's difficult. On the one hand, we have this unique skill and opportunity. On the other hand, we, we must find longevity in other ways through other organizations to keep those going. Yes, well, sir. I have one question, maybe you got it because he stood up. <laughs> OK. Sir, Besides, Lieutenant Colonel Mabry, tough kind of guy. Fort Sam Houston. Um, our research community seems to be focused a lot on therapeutics, a lot on material solutions. We've known from the war, or we've learned from the war, that, that, that big differences are made in training, leadership, and organization. How does the research realm get at those, um, uh, those segments of the dot mil PF equation to improve casualty survival, casualty outcome? Um, it seems like that's a vast, untapped area. How do we? How do we train the best medic? I use the analogy of golf. Um, if you have a golf budget, how do you spend your money? New golf clubs, new golf shoes, new golf balls, or do you spend it on golf lessons? We know the training pays off, but this is an area that we tip don't typically research training. Well, you're talking about, and that's in part what the DHA does. My intent is to work closely with General Miller in education and training on issues of clinical research, for example, because it, it, it is, there's a training component to the residents, for example. But on the bigger picture of Corman, there's also a technology driver. So when you talk about saving lives, to a great extent, the more we can enhance that first at the, at the site of injury response, the, the feeling is the better the chance the individual will survive. And so as an example, in DARPA, there's a project. We'll fix this image in your head. Remember the people with the baseball helmets with the two beers on either side and the straws going in? Think of it in terms of a backpack with various therapeutics that a corpsman with the right delivery agent can, through telemedicine, on site in these out-of-the-world places, 
pres get the prescription from whoever the doc is that's overseeing the data coming back or the assessment and deliver a personalized dose of whatever in order to stage them for what would be subsequent regenerative procedures so they're a better candidate down the road. Now this, this gets at enhancing survival and yet we're talking right now tens of percent of survival, which is very important. But it's incredible when you think in terms of from launch stool. You make it a launch school, you've got an over 99% chance of survival on the basis of advances already in place with, the, th with the, the theater we've dealt with. Move to the Pacific, now you have potentially longer distances, delayed transport, and other challenges which put in place make somebody say, well, okay, now I've got to sustain the person on the ship for two days as opposed to 20 minutes. What type of, what type of uh, approach to the treatment do I need for that? So I'm, I'm taking it from a couple of different points of view, but I would say it comes right back to that first responder and that in, in grouping emphasis around that, enhancing any way we can that wounded, injured, ill individual for subsequent rehabilitative therapy will be our focus. Is that, is that getting at your question? And that involves the technology is driven, it's gonna have to be incorporated into the, the Corman training for medic or whoever, you know, all services. All right, thanks Admiral Dahl, appreciate thank, it. Thank you, sir. <laughs>